Good evening, I'm Stone Grissom and welcome to our live coronavirus pandemic special report. Tonight, we have an esteemed doctor, you're gonna like this, from Stony Brook Southampton Hospital to help you sort through what's going on in the COVID-19 in our communities and across the region. We also wanna hear from you, it's a call-in show. The number's right there at the bottom of your screen, 516-393-1800. Well, there's been a milestone apparently in Nassau County today. Nassau County Executive Laura Curran says she believes the county has successfully met the three federal benchmarks toward reopening those CDC guidelines. It's declining hospitalizations, a decline in the number of new positive cases and ramped up testing. Now, Suffolk Executive Steve Ballone says uh, his county also not far behind. Now, here's where we stand right now. These are still just in, uh, staggering numbers. There are just under 300,000 confirmed cases. That's statewide. More than 69,000 of those right here on Long Island. The number of deaths still painfully high. New York battles COVID-19. Governor Cuomo says the decline has been slow at best and is still, as he says, disgustingly high. And that's true. The statewide death toll now breaking 18,000 lives. More than 2,800 souls lost here in Nassau and Suffolk. All right, let's get to our discussion tonight. Uh, I'm excited about this. I know you're going to be too. Joining us tonight, Dr. Rajiv Fernando. He's the director of infectious diseases at Stony Brook Southampton Hospital, a member of the organization Doctors Without Borders. Also, um, so many. You're the only doctor to go to China to investigate COVID-19. I, I want to thank you, especially. You're one of the people on the front lines. Uh, you're one of our heroes. So thank you so much. And uh, let me ask you, uh, how, how are you holding up? I am holding up very well. And firstly, thank you so much for having me. It's a wonderful opportunity to provide uh, concise and accurate information to the public, which is really the most important thing right now. Thanks again for having me. No, but no, thank you. You're, you're really doing us a, a service. Um, let me ask you about China. You, you are the only doctor to go there to investigate, specifically investigate this virus. Tell, tell us about that. Yeah, so every day, uh, infectious disease doctors, every day we receive in our email uh, what are the active outbreaks that are going on across the planet? Uh, and it's up to us to decide whether something is going to remain endemic or whether something's going to become more severe and ultimately become a pandemic. So with this one, it was pretty easy, actually, to be honest with you. It wasn't any sort of genius at all from my perspective. It was really a repeat of the 2002 situation where we had SARS uh, at that time. Same situation came out of a market in Guangdong. This time it's from Wuhan. And I smelled that this is going to be a problem. So I actually went down. I, I, of course, I follow literature, read up on stuff. But for me, I always like to look at things from my own to see what exactly from my own eyes. So with Zika, I went down to Brazil. Uh, for Ebola, I went down to Sierra Leone. And that was the obvious thing, the right thing to do here. Okay. Um, let's try to get a call in real quick. Uh, Lena from Comac. Lena, are you there? Yes, hi. Hi, how are you? What's your question tonight? Um, yes, I had an appointment for my physical, uh, my yearly physical, beginning of April. Um, I postponed it to next month. Um, I'm not sure I'm really comfortable going into a doctor's office, but I can't do the telehealth because I usually have a cardiogram, you know, blood pressure check, blood work. So I'm just wondering, you know, if I should postpone it again. You know, I don't know if things are going to be getting better, and they say it may come back in the fall. So, um, you know, I'd really like to get my physical done, but, you know, I'm apprehensive about it. Okay. Doctor, what, what would your advice be? Yeah, Alina, thank you for your question. And I understand your concerns. You know, this is a difficult time, and I understand your concerns. But as things move along, uh, we're sto slowly started opening up the, the hospital system. So elective surgeries are happening. And by this time, we really, hospitals are, hospital and outpatient settings are very, very careful and cognizant of the risks of patients uh, when they come in and contracting the virus while in house. So th we've all made appropriate precautions. Uh, of course, you can call your provider before coming in and you know there'll be appropriate social distancing, wear your mask as usual hand hygiene and the the doctor's offices now they're well in control of you know handling this situation and making sure that you're safe we've had close to two months of experience uh, with how we handle this right now and now i think by april definitely by uh, the end of next uh, week definitely we'll have uh, better options to go and you will be safe and, and doctor, let me follow up on that, because I know the FDA has made an emergency approval of, of remdesivir this is an antiviral uh, medication uh, how much of a breakthrough is this you know, I think it's important to understand remdesivir is actually an antiviral drug, which really has direct effect on the virus. It was actually tried out with Ebola uh, about uh, four years ago without any sort of success, but they were using this drug once again as a specific antiviral. It was used in China 
Uh, the first study over there really didn't sound promising. It, they came out with a study saying it was more, more like a placebo. But the NIH has done a study in the States right now with more than a thousand uh, subjects, and they're saying it could be a game changer. How is it going to be a game changer? It actually shortens the duration of illness from 15 days to about 11 days. So that's what it's really going to do. Remember, it's not the wonder drug. There is no wonder drug uh, at this point, but we're going to be trying this out before. Uh, prior to this, a couple of weeks ago, remdesivir was, you know, every hospital in the country uh, and every hospital in Europe was ordering this drug, and it was only made available to people who are pregnant and if you're less than 18 years of age. But now we have an urgent move towards using this drug, and I, I think it's very promising. It's very important to understand that we should use this early in the illness. That's what I feel. Once they're on mechanical ventilation, I feel it's sort of too late. So someone heading into the in the mild to moderate phase, that's where I think this will act uh, best. Uh, remains to be seen. But those are my thoughts. Early intervention is probably the way to go. Okay. Uh, let's go back to the phones. Uh, Joe, are you there? Yes, I am. What's your question tonight? Uh, with the warmer weather approaching, I was just wondering if mosquitoes or ticks and transmit COVID-19? Uh, thanks, Joe. Good question. Uh, we don't have any evidence of uh, ticks or mosquitoes uh, transmitting this virus at this point. Uh, there are other vectors, you know, as, as the summer comes closer with Lyme disease and other things like West Nile, but we don't have any evidence at this point that this virus can be transmitted through those vectors. Thank you. How, how dangerous is it that we're finding out the Duke study in North Carolina found a, a canine uh, with coronavirus? We've had two cats in New York State. Uh, how, how Should we be staying away from our pets at this point? I think that's a little bit of an overcall. We are going to keep having odd cases like this pop up. Uh, we've uh, been going at this since only uh, January uh, in the States and around the world. There are going to be a few odd cases that pop up where you have positive positive cats or dogs. For me, cats, the feline family is actually more at uh, more risk. Uh, they have a different receptor. They have an ACE2 receptor, which the virus can bind to. It's rare to have it in dogs, and that's why, you know, three months into the illness, we're probably seeing our first case right now. Remains to be seen, but I'm sure uh, the American Veterinary Association is on top of this, but definitely no need to panic right now. The poor dog that's infected, you know, uh, you're going to have to practice social uh, distancing. I'm not sure there are any dog masks out there, but certainly needs to go under production. Right, okay. Let's uh, try to get Karen in. Karen, are you there? Hi, yes. Thank you for taking my call. My call has to do with essential workers, not so much healthcare workers, but shopkeepers, um, mechanics, uh, those people who are working very long hours. Testing sites seem seem to close around four. What um, testing um, uh, is available for those workers who are working very long hours? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I think there are going to be more tests available. You know, the, the country is really ramping up on testing, and I think maybe we're very early into using the serology test. So I'm sure the country is going to rev up and have more testing sites. Uh, on that note, I'd like to say, you know, there is a home test that's available, but I really, I don't think that's a good idea. The reason is you're getting a peripheral blood uh, sample from there, which is you're just pricking your, your fingertip and actually getting a sample from there. And I don't know how accurate that's going to be. So it's really, uh, it's based on the, the person who's doing the test. They can easily make an error and it may fa cause a false test. So I'm not really happy with that. I really think we need to get a serum blood test and look for these antibodies. So I'm against it. At this point, I'm certainly against the home test uh, method. All right. Uh, let's try to get Robert in. Robert, you there? Hello. Uh uh, is this Robert? Yes, it is. What's your question tonight? I've got two quick questions. One is, if somebody's outside and they're talking and those are coming out of their mouth, uh, on a breezy or windy day, can they travel more than six feet? And uh, if the person has psoriasis on his palms, can they get the uh, virus to an open sore? Okay, um, Robert, those are great questions. Uh, we're going to take a real quick break. I'm going to let the doctor uh, ponder on those questions right now, and then we're going to answer them right after this break. We're going to have more expert advice on how to keep you and your family safe from the coronavirus. Remember, we want to hear from you. It's a call-in show. Call us at the number right there at the bottom of your screen, 516-393-1800. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to our live coronavirus pandemic special report. Let's bring back in Dr. Rajiv Fernando, the Director of Infectious Diseases at Stony Brook Southampton Hospital, works with Doctors Without Borders, the only U.S. doctor to go to China to investigate COVID-19, works with hospitals in New York City. I haven't even scratched the surface of all the things that you're involved with right now. Um, before the break, uh, Robert from Massapequa asked uh, about the added dangers of, of talking outside while on a breezy day and if someone has uh, psoriasis on their hands. I'll let you just answer that. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Uh, I'll take your first question about uh, outside in public. And this is, I feel, one of the reasons why the CDC actually upgraded the recommendations to actually wearing a mask. Remember, the concept of wearing a mask really is to uh, prevent, to kind of put in a wall, an, uh, an invisible wall. Uh, after you cough with you propel these respiratory virions outside, you're actually putting a mask which actually prevents this from going. So I really recommend uh, using a mask at this time, like the CDC has mentioned. With regards to your second question, there's no evidence the virus actually enters through a bre breach in the skin mucosa. So if you have psoriasis, there's no evidence at this point where it could enter that way. So you're good to go with that. Okay, uh, let's see, let's go to Felicia now. Felicia, you there? Yes. What, what's your question tonight? Yes, good evening. Um, my question is, um, with the state planning to reopen uh, soon, in stages with people not following guidelines with masks and gloves will we see a resurgence yeah great question felicia thank you for for that uh yes it's definitely concerning uh ever since uh governor cuomo actually mentioned the worst is over i've actually seen a very different trend uh nowadays when you go into new york city it's traffic as usual the same traffic jams and you know crashes and things of like that so it's very concerning uh, with regards to uh, the second wave, uh, let's talk about what's happened right now. We've flattened the curve through some pretty uh, reasonably aggressive lockdown measures. Now, just to put this in perspective, uh, when you say lockdown in part of, let's say, South Korea, you're actually fined if you go on, if you're found in the street without any sort of uh, indication why you're outside, you're fined heavily. I've known a, a person fined up to 8,000 US dollars for actually being seen outside. Places like India, if you reverse your car out in the street, you're arrested, given a fine over there. And China, I don't have to mention, draconian measures really kept everyone inside. So we've done well with our lockdown, but not as good as I'd like it to. Uh, so with regards to uh, flattening the curve, it's certainly possible if we don't continue to social distance, we'll start seeing a second cur uh, a second spike. And the thing that I'm really concerned about right now is, you know, it's been two months of hard work for the healthcare workers on the on the front lines uh, you know there are a lot of people going through depression psychiatric problems it's been very emotional for all of us on the front lines uh so they're exhausted and if we have a second spike i'm not sure whether the fragile healthcare system would really be able to go after that so you know uh, of course we will rise to the occasion but at this point you know healthcare workers are slightly beaten down definitely so we have to do all we can to prevent that second spike so continue social distancing what we're doing uh, a six feet like we were talking about. Samsung is actually coming out with a watch which kind of beeps uh, uh, when you're within uh, six feet of a person. So these are all great new technology uh, and uh, we ne just got to keep doing what we're doing. Of course, we have to reopen our country at some point. We can't go on like this. But even if we open very, very slowly in very small steps, we have to continue what we're doing right now. Thanks for that question. Yeah, okay. Uh, Rose, Rose, are you there? Rose, you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? I, I can hear you. What's your question tonight? Thank you for taking my um, question, and good evening. Um, the GI tract, I hear a lot about, you know, symptoms of, with the diarrhea. How is this affecting the GI tract, and when should we contact a doctor if we should happen to get episodes of diarrhea and um, GI problems? Yeah, this is a this is a great question, Rose. And uh, this is it's very important for all of us to understand outside that the co uh, coronavirus uh, does not exclusively in, uh, involve the lung. There are a lot of other manifestations, and I I really think what you brought up right now is uh, very important for the public to listen. Uh, I've seen up to forty percent of cases sometimes just present with a GI illness. Um, so that's important to talk to your doctor if you have a sudden onset of uh, GI illness, you've been exposed to someone, definitely contact your doctor about this. The other thing we're learning about this fascinating virus is it has an increased incidence of causing heart attacks, strokes, 
and uh, also uh, uh, clots in your lungs. So it's very important to know uh, uh, cardiologists and neurologists are way, way on top of this. So these are other manifestations of COVID-19. And it's really important for all of you out there to understand that uh, these other alternate syndromes uh, are involved as well. We see, I've been seeing a lot of skin conditions as well. So keep an eye out for this. As of right now, uh, heart attack still remains the number one cause of death in America. But the number two cause of death in America this month is COVID-19. So be wow. very vigilant with these symptoms. Wow, let's try to squeeze in uh, um, Susan, is it Susan? Yes, I'm here. Uh, what's your question tonight? Uh, my question is, I'd like to understand the mask in line with what he was just discussing, and thank you, Dr. Fernando, about the transmission and continuing to be vigilant. Since people have socially isolated for such a period of time, why are the cases still going up? And maybe if people understood the math, they would be more vigilant because they would realize we would get closer to really extinguishing as much as we can. Okay, we've got about 30 uh, seconds for the, for the answer. Uh, great question. Uh, so the thing in this situation is normally we have a phenomenon called herd immunity when something's been circulating around. Right now what we're seeing is we're seeing antibodies rise. Uh, what happens usually after an acute infection is you have antibodies response, and that really should provide immunity to the people. But this antibody response, we don't know well enough about it. I've seen cases of reinfection, so I don't know uh, how much antibody is required. So... I don't even know whether having antibodies can prevent a reinfection. So we're still learning more about this virus. Thanks for your great question. All right, and Dr. Fernando, that's all the time we have, but I want to thank you uh, personally from my, on, on behalf of me and from everyone here at News 12 and from all the Long Islanders. Uh, thank you to you and all your colleagues for everything that you're doing for us. And thank you for uh, calling in and for watching the show. We'll be back tomorrow at 7.